Hey there, it's Pastor Mike. Before we get to today's episode, I want you to know that we here at Time of Grace have a crazy amount of resources to help you in your walk of faith. From our weekly TV program, to written devotions, to video devotions, to a number of podcasts, to our blog, to books, and more books, and even more books, however you love to learn, we are here to help. So just head over to timeofgrace.org to sign up for our daily email to get connected to all these resources that will help connect you to Jesus. Now, on to today's episode. For God so loved the world. (laughs) What a comfort. And thank God it's true. And yes, everyone matters to Jesus, but it is striking when you read the Gospels and you see how Jesus has compassion on the person who has a need at that particular moment. Uh, There was one time in Jesus' ministry where a man with leprosy came to him uh, and the Bible says that this man was full of leprosy. In other words, uh, this disease was in its later stages. He was one of the literally untouchables of the ancient world. Uh, There was no known cure for this disease. And maybe one of the worst things about it wasn't just that the sufferer would be uh, physically affected, but that it would mean isolation for him, away from his family and his friends and and his community. Uh, And so this man was pushed out uh, to live in the lonely places of the desert with other people who suffered from the same torment. And I mean it when I say that. It's why the ancient people called the disease leprosy, uh, because leprosy is a word that means to be stricken by God. I mean, you can only imagine how, how long he had watched his family grow up from afar, or how many times he had to cry out, unclean, unclean to the passerby to keep them at a safe distance. And in fact, the the penalty or the punishment for not yelling unclean was stoning. How long had it been since that man felt human skin touch his own? But this man hadn't despaired. Instead, he goes up to Jesus and he falls at his feet and he speaks one of the most beautiful prayers in all of Scripture in just nine words, in English anyway. He said, if you are willing... You can make me clean. What a perfect prayer. Oftentimes, when we have our greatest need, our prayers are short. (laughs) Lord, help me please. Amen. You know. If you are willing, you can make me clean. It's a perfect prayer because there's no complaining. Uh, The man isn't making demands of Jesus. Instead, he's throwing himself entirely on the will of Jesus. He knows that if Jesus isn't willing, well, then he's going to die. He can't imagine it. But he's not going to lecture Jesus. Instead, he throws himself entirely on the will of Jesus. And then the next line in the account, you need to read a thousand times and then some, and you still won't mind the depths of Jesus' love. It says that Jesus looked at the man and he had compassion for him. And it uses that special word that means that Jesus cared about the man so much that that his guts, his insides were turning over inside of himself because of how much he cared. And then he did the seemingly unthinkable. He reached out and he touched the man. And just imagine the gasps of horror at the bystanders who see Jesus reach out and touch a leper. Nobody does that. Jesus actually touched a leper. But just think about what that meant to that man, that touch. It meant everything. And then Jesus went on and and did something even better. Uh, And with the same simplicity as that man's prayer, he said, I am willing, be clean. And instantly like that, the man was cleansed of his leprosy. A a simple prayer, a powerful answer. Have you ever felt like the outcast? I, I mean, honestly, sometimes it's our own fault. But then sometimes it's not. I mean, perhaps your family doesn't understand you. Maybe your co-workers look down on you. Do some of the kids make fun of you in school? I'm so sorry. But you need to hear the answer that Jesus gives to your prayer. I am willing. Be clean. Now, if people were shocked at Jesus touching a leper, how much more should we be shocked that Jesus was willing to reach out and touch you and me? Jesus had compassion on us and he came for us. I mean, why leave heaven for the slime pit of earth? Why trade his holiness to touch me and take my sin on him on the cross? And yet he did. He did it because he loves me. He did it because he loves you. Always remember your greatest benefit is at the cross. No matter what may be happening in your life, you can go to Jesus there and hear his answer to your prayer, I am willing, be clean. 
when you find yourself walking away from Jesus in life, no matter what you've done, there's forgiveness for every sinner, even before you pray, if you are willing. Jesus grants the request. Let's pray. Jesus, you care for the whole world, but you also care for each person in need. You are willing, you can make me clean. Point me to your cross every day to hear your answer. I am willing, be clean. In your precious name I pray, amen. What do you need? <laughs> when we're suffering, the thing that we're suffering from seems to be our greatest need. You know, if we could just do away with this thing, then we would be happy. Well, today we see that Jesus has compassion on those who suffer and he meets our need uh, whether we know exactly what that need is or not. It's a, a touching story that makes, makes its way into every Sunday school curriculum. It was a standing room only day in the life of Christ. He was preaching and this house was packed with people and outside the house were four friends carrying another friend on uh, on a mat and that fifth friend was paralyzed and they wanted to get that friend into Jesus so that Jesus could heal him. Uh, and as Jesus always does, he was going to give that man more than he thought he needed. Well, the Bible tells us that the friends were pretty uh, resourceful to say the least. They actually climbed up on top of the roof of the house that Jesus was preaching in and they dug through the thatch roof and lowered the man down um, in front of Jesus. You just imagine Jesus says he, he looks up and sees the newly created skylight and sees the four silhouettes of heads. The Bible simply says Jesus saw their faith. Okay, so now you're Jesus and you have this paralyzed man in front of you. What do you do? Well, it would seem that this man's greatest need would be to be able to walk. But as is always the case with Jesus, he sees the need behind the need. Jesus knew that this man's greatest need was not so that he could walk in this life, but so that he could walk in eternal life. And so he looks at the man and he says, my child, your sins are forgiven. So what is the source of all of your troubles in life? How would you fill in the blank if I said, if I only had fill in the blank, then I'd be happy. Have you ever noticed that when you get the thing you think you need, another need pops up just like that? You know, you get that dream job you were hoping for and and then you also get the stress that comes with it. You, you get that spouse you've been praying for, but then you find out that Mr. Perfect or Mrs. Perfect isn't so perfect. That you finally get to retirement you've been dreaming about for years and then you struggle with fulfillment. You finally beat cancer, but there's still something that nags at happiness. Do you know what it is? It's sin. You see, the source of all of our troubles don't come from outside of us. It comes from inside and Jesus knows that. Jesus knows that sin that no one else knows, but you can't forget. He knows that thing you said you would never do, but you ended up doing. He knows about that addiction that promises to heal you every day, but only leaves your conscience in shreds. He knows everything that you suffer. And it's precisely for that reason that he, know, he comes to us, or we come to him with a million wishes and it's for that reason that he doesn't necessarily always give us what we think we need. Instead, he knows what's happening in our head when those things happen. He knows that we're thinking, is God angry with us? Is he going to abandon us? Has he lost patience with us? And the answer is no. Instead, Jesus uses those things to drive us to him so that he can look at you in the eye and say, my child, your sins are forgiven. Just look at how he speaks to you so tenderly, my child. That's literally how he addresses the young man who was paralyzed um, that he healed. You see, Jesus deals with you as an individual. He deals with each person one at a time. In the whole history of your life, he treats you as though you are his only relative. Like there are only two people in the universe, you and him, and right now he's looking at you and he says, my child, your sins are forgiven. And so no matter what is happening to you today, no matter what you're going through, go to him. He wants to help you. After all, he's already taken care of your greatest need by dying on the cross to take away your sins so that he could say to you, my child, your sins are forgiven. Let's pray. Lord, when I suffer, it's easy to take my eyes off of you and recognize my daily need of your forgiveness. Point me to your cross for the assurance of my forgiveness as well as the guarantee that you care for me in my suffering. In your name I pray, amen. 
This week we're talking about how Jesus has compassion on each person. Yes, he cares for everyone, but he cares for each person and their individual need. Uh, today I want to talk about how Jesus has compassion on the controlled. Now what do I mean by that? Um, yes, the, the account for today is Jesus casting out a demon from a demon-possessed man, but I'm not necessarily just talking about physical demon possession. Um, have you ever heard anyone talk about uh, being uh, the, the struggling with their demons? Well. It's true. I mean, evil is behind every sin and it's controlling, like a demon sinking his talons into your soul. And Jesus hates evil. Uh, you could see that back when evil and sin first entered the world back in the garden. Uh, God walked into the garden and saw the serpent smiling to himself. He looked over at Adam and Eve, his, his newly corrupted creatures, and, and they were pointing blame at everybody but themselves for eating the fruit. And you know what? God got angry. Not in a sinful way, but in a just and holy way because God hates evil. In fact, do you know who he spoke the first promise of a savior to? It wasn't to the recipients, Adam and Eve, it was actually to Satan. He wanted to make sure Satan knew that he was going to crush that evil. And so you can just hear God booming, I will put enmity, I will put hatred between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. God hates evil. And so you, you fast forward uh, to the account in the New Testament before us today and, and it's an account that makes the hair on your arm stand on end. There was this demon-possessed man and he lived out in the caves. He screamed out all night, every night, and he cut himself with stones. And one day he introduced himself to Jesus and it's the creepiest name in the world. He said, my name is Legion, for we are many. I dare you to say that to yourself in a dark basement. That is creepy because demons are powerful. And yet in the presence of Jesus, we see the limits of their power. Uh, you see, demons know that who do you think you are look on Jesus' face uh, when somebody so evil is trying to hurt someone so dear to Jesus. Uh, finally, in the presence of Jesus, the demons have no other choice but to leave. Jesus hates evil. And do you know why they have to leave? because Jesus told them to. That's how much more powerful Jesus is than demons. And that's maybe something we need to understand. Um, when you think of the devil, don't think of the devil as the opposite of God. Oh, he's certainly bad enough to be that, but he's not big enough to be that. You see, Satan is not a god. Not even close. He's, he's a creature. And hell, by the way, is his prison. Uh, hell's not his home. What demons have control of you? Is it an addiction? Is it uh, anger that rides too close to the surface? Is it incessant selfishness? Well, know that Jesus wants to cast those demons out too because he wants to make his home in your heart. Listen to what he says in Luke 17. He says, The kingdom of God does not come with your careful observation, nor will people say, Here it is or there it is, because the kingdom of God is within you. Jesus wants to cast those demons out of your heart, and he has. Remember, it's what he promised to do in the garden. Jesus came into this world to do battle for your soul, and the devil lost. Uh, Jesus crushed the devil's accusations against you about all the sins you do by paying for all of them on the cross, and the devil lost. Uh, Jesus crushed the devil's head by walking out of that grave alive on Easter morning, and the devil lost. Jesus wants to cast the demons out of your heart and make his home there. Now you're free. Now you win. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, whatever demons I may have, cast them out of me with your powerful command and presence in my heart. Help me do battle and overcome until that day final victory is realized in heaven. Amen. This week, we're looking at the compassion of Jesus for each one. And today, I'd like to mix it up a little bit and look at Jesus' compassion for the masses because although he cares for each one, he also cares for everyone. Do you remember the feeding of the 5,000? So the disciples had just come back from their preaching mission across the countryside and Jesus knew they needed some rest. So he sent them ahead uh, to go and, and rest up for a little bit. But the crowds uh, beat Jesus and the disciples there. And when Jesus saw them, it says something touching in the Bible. It says, He had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. In other words, he gave them what they needed most. He gave them food for their souls, 
But then, of course, you know what happens next. With five small loaves and two fish, he fed 5,000 people. He fed 5,000 people with a little bread and a couple of fish. Now, have you ever put that miracle into perspective? I mean, think about it this way. Is it any greater miracle than Jesus feeding billions of people every day? Is it really any greater miracle than Jesus feeding you every day? Take 5,000 meals and divide it by three meals a day and you come out to about four and a half years worth of days. So that means if you are not yet in kindergarten or almost in kindergarten and watching this, then you've experienced the equivalent of this miracle. And if you're 90 and watching this, then you have experienced this miracle over 20 times. Jesus has compassion on the masses. He has compassion on you and he provides for your bodily needs. But Jesus also has compassion on the world and provides for our spiritual needs too. The Bible says God so loved the world that what did he do? He gave his son to die on a cross, not just for you, but for the whole world. Uh, Jesus has compassion, um, yes, for the individual. And if you know me and you know my devotions, you know I love to focus on Jesus' love just for you. But there's also a benefit in thinking about his love for everyone and anyone. You got to love that word, anyone. I love it when my wife says that word, anyone. Um, you know, when she comes back from grocery shopping, um, I'll admit that I, I love potato chips. It's a weakness. I love to eat them. And when she comes back from grocery shopping and she's setting the bags on the counter, my eyes are rifling through those bags to find that bright orange bag of Doritos. But I have learned from experience that I can't just dive into those things. I need to wait for her clearance. And so I'll ask something innocent like, oh, who are those for? And, you know, sometimes she crushes my dreams and she says, those are for the taco salad for the party tomorrow night. Don't touch them. Or I want to use those for the kids' lunches tomorrow. Stay away. But sometimes she opens up the door of delight and she says, oh, anyone. And since I am anyone, that means those chips are for me. Do you see the point? <laughs> Jesus' love is for anyone. That means it's also for you. And so no matter what you've done, no matter who you've been, no matter how far you've wandered away, no matter how deep you've fallen, Jesus loves the masses. Jesus' love is for anyone. That means it's for you. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, I know you love the whole world so much that you came to save each and every person that has ever lived. Today, comfort me with the fact that since you love the masses, that means you also love me. In your precious name I pray. Amen. She was sick. The Bible says that she had been bleeding for 12 years. Because of her uncleanness or because of the bleeding, she was unclean and couldn't go to church for over a decade. People who passed her by would have definitely said, felt sorry for her. Poor woman. At night, she only had reprieve and sleep after she drenched her pillow with tears. She tried everything and had exhausted all of her resources Days turned into months, it turned into years. People would have looked at her and said, she's a nobody. Then you've got Jairus, the big, strong, synagogue ruler, very important man. And he had a daughter who was, who was dying. And so he went to Jesus in the crowd and he said to Jesus, my little baby girl's dying, you got to come help. And so Jesus went, no time to waste. And on the way, um, they were passing through a crowd and our woman comes up and and without Jesus noticing, just touches his cloak and she's healed just like that from her bleeding after 12 years. And then Jesus stops. Now, you can just imagine the look on the disciples' face and the look on Jairus' face going, Jesus, what are you doing? There's a little girl that's dying. We need to go. And then you could see Jesus look on his face uh, that was saying, don't you know that there's a woman who's been dying for 12 years that I have to talk to? And so Jesus asks, who touched me? And the disciples actually laugh at him. And they say, who touched you? Come on, we're in a crowd. Everybody's touching you. But Jesus wouldn't have it. Instead, what was Jesus doing? He was watching and looking. He wouldn't stop scanning the crowd until he found her, until finally this, this meek, suffering woman fell at his feet. And, and the Bible says that she told him everything. Literally, she told him the whole truth. Now that's something. It, it, Jesus, the busiest person in the world, but was never in a hurry. He listened to the whole truth. Can you imagine 12 years of suffering, how long that would take? And then after, after she told him everything, Jesus simply said to her, daughter, 
go in peace. Oh, that word daughter. Uh, she was unclean. She hadn't been to the temple in over a decade. The thing she longed to hear more than anything was daughter. All the while, the important synagogue ruler had to wait his turn. Yes, Jesus cares for the masses, but he also cares for each individual. Do you find yourself uh, feeling like others don't find you very important? Well, then look to Jesus and see what he's doing. He's scanning the crowd, looking just for you. Look to Jesus. Look to his cross and see that he died not only for the whole world, but he, he died just for you. Look to your Savior, Jesus, who makes nobodies into somebody. And just in case you're wondering if Jesus helped Jairus' daughter, he did. After raising her from the dead, um, there's this little line at the end of the account that some might just gloss over, but I don't think we should. It says, and Jesus told them to give her something to eat. Do you see why that's such a beautiful line? Do you think her parents didn't know to give her something to eat? Of course they did. They had been feeding her for 12 years. But it shows that Jesus cared about her down to the last detail. The one that nobody notices, Jesus notices. As much as he does Peter and James and John, what a comfort that is. When you think that nobody cares, remember that Jesus cares not just for the masses, but he cares for you down to the last detail. He cares for you as an individual. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for blessing this week. Thank you for showing us that you care for the outcast, for the suffering, the controlled, the masses, and especially the individual in need. Teach me to especially care for those in my life who are in need. In your name I pray, amen.